Welcome to the Retrospective Perspective with Jeremy Ariel Diaz. I want to thank you for tuning in and checking out what I have to say on pop culture and art and its debt to itself. It is the one year anniversary of the Retrospective Perspective and I want to do something a little special by giving you three episodes doing things I haven't necessarily done before. This episode will be a first in a new ongoing series where I review music memoirs and rockumentaries. Feel free to leave any suggestions for something you'd like me to review in the comments. Hope you enjoy! Mariah Carey uses a surgical eye on her songwriting, producing, and even on her manicured image. That same meticulousness is utilized to tell her life story in The Meaning of Mariah, a deftly crafted memoir showing us the hows and whys of her artistry and womanhood, then and now. The first quarter of the memoir focuses on Mariah's childhood, where she describes how she became, quote, less of a child and more of a miracle, end quote referring to the various close calls she had as a kid, a deus ex machina that seems to appear in multiple instances of Mariah's life will leave you believing in blessings over serendipity. It appears at the crossroads she stood at when presented with the choice to use the same drugs that caused her sister to become addicted, or when she could have possibly been pimped out and almost raped by her sister's boyfriend, and even allowed her to evade the chastisement her father lashed out on her siblings, much to their vexation. She makes it very clear that the memoir is a collection of moments that matter to her and is the unashamedly subjective telling of those stories. This is why we get random childhood anecdotes of her favorite way to eat a Ritz cracker or her fixation on the leg that was missing from a chair at a relative's house. Upon first listen, one can interpret these chapters as just a sort of diary filled with memories that matter dearly to Mariah and that she's honored us with a glimpse into. When paying closer attention, one realizes these stories are also integral to the kind of songwriter she would become. It's evident that some of the themes she would touch on on some deep album cuts are presented here. That of healing and loving on your younger self and reconciling with relics of the past. But even the way she glamorizes the mundane with flowery words in her music and in her memoir comes from the way she has always experienced life, from girl to woman, wide-eyed and taking in all the senses. One of the more poignant revelations in the book is Mariah's explanation of her obsession with Christmas and being quote-unquote eternally 12. This age was the time in Mariah's life she believes she lost her innocence and was awakened to the darkness of the world and people around her. And that holiday was one in which she could never fully enjoy because of the constant upheaval of her family. This, alongside special Christmas memories like the fabulousness of her gunkles during the holidays and being stuck inside during a snowstorm, inspired the first number one hit of the 2020s, the 90s classic, All I Want for Christmas Is You. Stories like these are the highlight of the memoir because we're able to see how beautiful the thread is between her experiences and her music. Another one of these threads is in how one of her dad's petty scoldings also contributed to her songwriting. In a rush to get to the ice cream truck, Mariah asks her dad if she can borrow some money. Unfazed by the huff she's in, he asks her to clarify if she'd like him to lend her the money or give her the money. This subtle parental chiding taught Mariah the importance of words and their meanings. And now when fans jest that listening to Mariah's music can also be a vocabulary lesson, they'll know why. Consider also Mariah's explanation for why she doesn't dance as much as people would like during her performances. Once upon a time, her family members would use dancing as a barometer to gauge how black or white she was, which somewhat paralyzed her to rhythm. Growing up in a world before being racially ambiguous was considered exotic by modern beauty standards, Mariah's is a tale of finding identity through musicianship, transcending the labels of black or white altogether. As Mariah grew into young adulthood, her passion transformed into ambition, and her attention to detail led to the ingenuity that would help her navigate her way into the music world. The providence that followed her as a child was equally present in young adulthood. For example, after befriending Will Smith, when she was a professional backup singer, she found herself at Def Jam headquarters and was given the opportunity to showcase her demo tape to executives there, but she held off. She knew Def Jam would swoop her up if she showed them her work, 
but she had her eye less on the niche and fresh labels like Def Jam and more on the established household names like Columbia or Warner Records. Any other aspiring star would have jumped at any chance to be signed, but Mariah knew her material was good enough to get her exactly what she wanted. Her judgment did lapse at one point though, when she signed a makeshift, but legally viable, contract that had been photocopied from what seemed like a music business for dummies textbook. An unsigned writer she had been working with, with whom she co-wrote a bulk of her debut album, presented her the contract and had her sign it. What Mariah didn't know was that he'd not only make huge money off of her first album, but also her second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth albums, all for which he made exactly zero writing or producing contributions to. Despite him making a living off of the music Mariah made independently of him, she never disparages him in the memoir and even expresses gratitude for helping her create the music that would give her the golden ticket to make her dreams come true, opting to never renegotiate the contract. The familiar good fortune of her childhood wasn't completely gone though, as it led her to watch a documentary of the Beatles' struggle to own their publishing. It left such an impression on her that she made sure to make wise business moves wherever she could. The best of these moves? Becoming the wife of Columbia Records CEO Tommy Mottola. It's evident that Mariah's choice to marry Mottola was fueled by her need to find the security she was not granted as a child. Despite the tumultuous nature of their marriage and divorce, and Mariah's obvious disdain for the man, she credits him for clearing the way for her to become the star of her label. Mariah's songwriting prowess, coupled with the relentless promotional efforts no doubt spearheaded by Tommy to ensure his wife's success, is what allowed her first five singles to all reach number one on the Billboard charts consecutively, a first ever in the music industry. Despite Tommy's marketing genius, the means to the successful end were faulty, as he whitewashed Mariah's identity, look, and music to market her to quote-unquote mainstream audiences. Mariah's identity was obscured as she was presented to the world as multicultural instead of biracial. What's not mentioned in the book is how Mariah expressed in early 90s interviews, with what was most likely media training, that she couldn't identify as one thing or the other as she came from Irish, African, and Venezuelan ancestry, the Venezuelan being that her father had an Afro-Latino background. In her emancipated years, however, we see that Mariah identifies as biracial and recognizes that her father's identity was one tied to that of the African-American experience. Furthermore, Mariah writes that her look was whitewashed because Motola did not allow her to change her hairstyle, as using a heating comb made her look more black to him than if she were to keep her natural curls, which presented a more exotic look. And finally, her music was whitewashed because she fought tooth and nail to experiment with pure R&B and hip-hop sounds, but Matola and her label resisted, wanting to keep her in the adult contemporary genre. Despite her professional and personal frustrations all seeming to be rooted in the same place, she chose to funnel the angst into creativity, resulting in the most staggering stories of the book. Channeling an alter ego inspired by the Riot Girls of the 90s, Mariah created quote-unquote ridiculous tortured songs while simultaneously working on the soulful Daydream album in 1995. She wished she could be like the Courtney Loves and Sleater Kinneys of the time, who made music in a quote-unquote irreverent, raw, and urgent way to reflect how she actually felt inside. So she did just that, discreetly. The grunge songs she worked on were eventually recorded by the band Chick and compiled on the album Someone's Ugly Daughter that same year, with Mariah's background vocals left intact. Though Mariah has recently implied that she plans to find the original recordings of her lead vocals to possibly release it, Copies of the now out-of-print album sell for around $800 on Amazon and eBay. Another noteworthy revelation is the rationalization of Mariah's knack for completely revamping her songs when releasing remixes. Mariah admits that the remixes themselves were sometimes what she actually envisioned for the original song, like in the case of the Always Be My Baby, Mr. Dupree mix. Any lamb knows that a Mariah remix isn't just handed off to a DJ to whip up something quick for radio consumption, but the elusive chanteuse tends to go back into the studio to not only rearrange the songs herself, but re-record new vocals to fit the new arrangement, usually leaning towards a dance club sound, and later in her career, she made hip-hop remixes as well. 
Mariah explains that where she usually wanted a song to go would either be too experimental or too urban for what the label wanted from her, so she allowed herself to let loose and be unrestrained on the remixes. In the words of Mariah herself, under different circumstances of course, this is all Tommy Matola's fault. In the meaning of Mariah, Carrie shows us the enigmatic sides of herself we can't decipher from just her lyrics or her interviews. For example, despite carrying herself regally, she pays absolute reverence for the great R&B singers who came before her. Or how she describes herself as someone who's never been quote-unquote hungry for sex, which could be explained by her feeling perpetually 12, yet fell madly in love with Derek Jeter in a way she doesn't describe feeling for anyone else. Fun fact, most of the 1997 Butterfly album is inspired by their affair, The Roof being a true-to-fact retelling of their first kiss. Another fun fact about the fun fact, Mob Deep's Shook Ones Part 2 played on the radio of her car ride home that night, which she would sample as the bass track for The Roof. Have I convinced you yet that her career was meant to be? Mariah's journey from dysfunctional family to starving artist to mismatched marriage and back to dysfunctional family who tried to pull a hashtag free Britney on her are all pieces of an incomplete puzzle. This memoir shows how Mariah filled in the blank spaces herself through music, humor, and self-preservation, and painted a rainbow out of a black and white world. Thanks for listening. To view the sources used in the recording of this podcast, visit retrospectiveperspective.com. Be sure to follow the Retrospective Perspective on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for all updates regarding new episodes and to join in on the conversation.